We have already seen that the Lord is good. We come to recognize this together as your people. We lift up this hour. All that we say and do and sign and think, all of those things bring glory to you. And it's in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. Let us pray before we start this morning. Or tonight. Some of you know it'll be the kickoff for Vacation Bible School. So I'm asking you to take time today. It doesn't have to be long. But just take a few moments to just pray for two things. First of all, that all the volunteers that have come to serve, pray for them. And we praise God for them. Thank you for those people who have willing hearts to serve. And I believe we have enough volunteers, right? 28 volunteers. Wow. Thank you, Lord, for that. And secondly, pray for the children. Some have signed up. Some have not yet signed up. There's a borderline whether they're going to come. So pray for those children. And the families also. But the children themselves, pray that the Lord will just touch each one of those children 
and that they will understand in their hearts and in their minds the message and just see God's love through the volunteers. So pray for that, those children this morning. God has a plan for those children. You and the rest of our volunteers are part of that plan. Amen? All right. So pray for that during this week. chapter 2. This morning we're looking at verses 9 and 10. You are chosen people. You are royal priests. holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Let us start with a prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for saving us. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. Thank you, Jesus, for putting up with us. For growing us teaching us, showing us your way. And now these two verses help us understand clearly what they're saying. Also, and how it applies. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. I'm not sure if the next slide is the right one. What is the biggest challenge or threat to your faith? Or the biggest challenge or threat to the church as a body today? What do you think that is? I'm sure most of you haven't spent a lot of time really thinking about this question or worrying about this question but I think it's worth consideration for a few moments this morning. You might envision, well, maybe the biggest danger or threat today is seen radical politics, perhaps. We notice more and more people have no tolerance for Christian perspective. Christian commentary is oppressed. Perhaps you were thinking, oh, what's worse is atheism. It's rampant, especially in high schools today. Do you notice more and more kids? Their attitudes, they don't have to believe in God, therefore, I'm not going to believe in God, period. Or maybe you were thinking what's worse would be materialism. constant pull. You see advertisements, friends, family, they have these things. And then you start to make comparisons. Maybe I need this. Maybe those things would make me happy. And then you're saying, no, what's worse, the worst of all of this is the immoral lifestyles today. It's rampant. We see it all over today. It seems today everything is acceptable. And the list could go on and on. I could add more. But I've mentioned here a few. And they can challenge us. It's true. They can threaten us. That's true. 
But if you study the Bible, you will come to realize the biggest challenge is not the four things that we've mentioned this morning. It's not them. The biggest threat is right here. It's your heart and my heart. Peter's addressing two specific examples here. The first one we already mentioned previously, but we're mentioning it again. The second one is up here. And I'll explain what those two mean. The first threat, identity amnesia. That's not my concept. That phrase I borrowed from a man by the name of Tripp. I like his term for that. And it just means that we're here and we face life, we face jobs, we have families, maybe we're working on getting education, maintaining friendships, all of those things, that's different activities, commitments, all of those things. We don't have busy life yet. We just go through it. And then we forget who we are. We forget who we are and who we are is because of Jesus. We remember, yes, God forgives me. He has forgiven me, I remember that. But everything he's given me means that he's also given me his identity. I have a new name, a new purpose, a new mission, all of these things. We forget about them because we are so busy with life. And the danger of that is when you forget who you are, you forget your identity, if you forget who you belong to, all of those things, then we tend to replace it with something else. Something else becomes more important. We replace it with, an example could be a job title, or we replace it with education, or we replace it with different roles. I'll give you some examples. God has blessed us, some of us, with marriage. Some of us have wonderful marriage. What a great gift. But if your sole identity is a spouse, that role, that's not your identity. That is not who you are. Your moms or dads, great roles that we have. But that is not your identity. Because when your children are grown and then they leave, who am I? I'm lost. If you're a spouse and they die, or the spouse leaves you, my identity is solely as a spouse, and they're gone. Who am I? If you're fired from your job, or you retire from your job, you have been at that, that's who you are. I am this job, I label myself as this job. And then when that's gone, it means you have nothing. So Peter here, really before that, back in chapter one, and again he brings it up now, he is <coughs> emphasizing identity. Talking about identity issues. Who are you? And again and again, he challenges the church. Yes, you are facing pain. You're facing difficult times. But don't forget who you are. Don't forget who you belong to. Don't forget your purpose, your mission here. And that's the first danger. The second danger he mentions is individualism. Meaning that my Christian faith really is about who? It's about the relationship between me and God. That's it. Me and Jesus. That's it. And I'm sure people have told you that. If you try to talk to them, try to encourage them, try to challenge them, they'll say, uh-uh, this is between me and God. This is my business. Okay, the problem here is what? That is not what the Bible teaches us. God has called you and welcomed you into a community. It's not just a one-on-one -on -one relationship. It's a community <coughs> relationship. And that's why in the New Testament, it describes us. How does it do that? As a body, a family, 
a temple. And it reminds us of that relationship with God. It's not just about me alone. Yes, we do have that relationship, definitely. That intimacy, that depth, hopefully. That kind of relationship where we can grow together. But if we push aside everyone else, we can't do that. So it's talking about us here. And you know that many people, Christians, their vision of the church is kind of like a shopping mall. Some of you may have seen this example before. People from all different cultures, different backgrounds, different areas within the community, different ages, different educational levels, different races, they all come there to this shopping mall. They happen to be there at the same time, the same place, and they want to get something for themselves. Maybe it's a good meal. Maybe they want to buy a new dress, a new shirt. They want to get something. And when they get what they want, then they take off. They go. And that's it. They don't have a relationship with the other shoppers. I don't need that. I get what I want. Got what I needed. The employees there, eh, I'm not worried about them. They'll take my money, they'll give me what I need, and then I'll leave. But that is not the church. You are not just a single person, an individual who comes. They come here, they get what I want, get some encouragement, I wanting some teaching, Maybe you want a bit of a challenge, and then it's done. I'm content, and I go back to my private life. But again, what the Bible teaches us, God's people, we are all connected. You are connected with every person here in this room. And I know you might rather keep your private life private. It's my business, I'll come, get what I want and leave. Maybe you don't want a relationship with the brothers and sisters here, but that is not what the Bible teaches us. It always go back to obedience. Did you notice that? It always comes back to obedience, whether we obey the Lord or not. And we can continue to rebel. With our heart, we can rebel. So Peter describes here, us, he's talking about us within verse 9. So let's look at that again. You, he's not saying individually, he's saying you as a plural, all of you, y'all, if you're from Texas, you know they say y'all, you are chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. You are his. And again, did you notice? He doesn't say chosen person. He doesn't say that. He says people. And it's interesting, another translation. It says, another translation says, you are a chosen race, a chosen race. So let's look at those words carefully this morning. First of all, I want to make sure we understand something here. God's mission, his purpose for this body, for his body. Our work here is for God's kingdom. And that requires life together. I want that to be embedded in your minds and your hearts. His work requires life together. Tonight we're going to kick off Vacation Bible School, and it requires life together. So to arrive at that goal, 
for his kingdom. It requires life together. So your perseverance as a Christian. You're going to get beat up. You're going to have struggle. Ups and downs. Successes and failures. That requires life together. You cannot succeed alone. As a Christian, it's impossible. God never intended that for us, to succeed alone as a Christian. He never intended that. And it's not there within the Bible. So my point is, you have to change your way of thinking. You have to change that American way of thinking. <coughs> Me, myself. Okay, so now, those words, I want to look at some of them. First of all, Chosen race. Chosen race. Suppose you were to meet a new person. What's the first thing you notice about that person? Probably their race. Are they white? Are they black? Asian? Whatever. You notice that. And it's a huge issue today. Politically, in society, all over, race is an issue. You can't avoid the topic. And a person's racial identity, whether they be black, Native American, Asian, Hispanic, Jewish. But Peter is saying here that God created a new race. A new race. A spiritual race. And that is how deep your Christian identity should be. It's hard for us to envision because... Most of the time, our race is one of the first things we identify by. I'm African American, I'm Asian, whatever, fill in the blank. Asian American, Asian deaf, whatever. But Peter is saying, no, no. If you belong to Christ, that's not your identity. You now have to relate to a new race, a spiritual race. And what makes you different from the rest of the world is not your skin color. What makes you different is that now you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And for the past few months, I know some of you have talked about relationships through DNA tests. Some of you have taken DNA tests find out about your history, your heritage, your background, all of that, 23andme.com. I signed up to that. It's a birthday gift for me from my wife. She gave it to me. Thank you, Deb. That was nice. So looked into my background. And I found two first cousins that I never knew I had. Two first cousins. Wow. And it was fun. It was fascinating. And it really caused me to think a lot about who I am, how I identify myself. Am I a Myers? Am I really a Myers? Or am I really a Schmidt? My birth name was Schmidt. So which one of those am I? Am I English? And does it matter? I'm sure some of you are wondering about those things too. Does it really matter? All of those labels that we have, are they important or not? Maybe you think, yes, it's important, and I get that. But in verse 9, it's saying no. My earthly identity here, my family relationship, my race is not the most important part of my identity. Because when I die, all of those labels will be gone. So to dwell on all those different labels, and I know it is neat to feel those connections with the past, and I totally get that. But verse 9 is very clear here. It says all of those labels mean nothing for eternity. And I'm not just saying that Christians should not check into their DNA. I'm not saying that. It's fun. It's enjoy it. Enjoy yourself by doing it, but keep perspective with it. God, our creator, 
has chosen us, has decided to love me. He decided to love me. That means that I will eternally belong to that body of people, that new race of people. And that's what it means that I follow Jesus Christ. I belong to a new group, a new race. Wow. Okay, so now. Royal priesthood. Royal priests. That means the king's priest. So that means when you go back to the Old Testament, you understand what Peter was talking about here. You realize for thousands and thousands of years, God's people could not stand before God the Father and talk to him intimately, directly. They could not do that. They had to rely on priests. God would appear only before the high priests within a certain area of the temple called the holiest of the holies. And the priests would enter into that room and they would pray, ask for forgiveness for the people. The people could not enter that room. Only one. The high priest could come into that room. And I'm sure you've seen pictures. Maybe you've seen drawings. Enter into the Holy of Holies, that room. And you notice that a big curtain. The Bible called it a veil. A big curtain. The Holy of Holies rooms had that curtain. And then there was the rest of the temple. So that represented the separation between God the holy. He couldn't interact with the unholy people. So they had a curtain to separate them. So when Jesus was crucified, you remember what happened? The veil was torn. And that represented, it was torn, it really happened. But it represented what? That represented from now on, God's people could, through Jesus, could directly talk to the Father. Because of Jesus' work on the cross. Okay. So verse 9 again, it says the priest at any time could stand before the Father. And now you are his priests. Now you can stand before the Father. You don't need another person to intervene for you. The Father is there, and he is welcoming you to come. Come. And the priest had another responsibility, too. And it was a big job. And that was sacrifice. Sacrificing. They would offer a sacrifice to stand before the Father. They would sacrifice an animal, the blood. And that would be done in for forgiveness of the people. So we don't sacrifice animals anymore. We don't do that anymore. And I'm thankful for that. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, he sacrificed all for us. That one sacrifice, Jesus on the cross, took care of it for all sin, past, present, and future. But in you, as a priest, the expectations are the same. You will make a sacrifice still. You will sacrifice your life, which means you will sacrifice your gifts. You will sacrifice your time. You will sacrifice your talents. You will sacrifice your resources. You will sacrifice your education, your will, your stubbornness, your will. You need to let go of that. You will sacrifice your strength, your energy, your relationships. All of those things will serve the king. Your life, everything you use will be for his purpose here on out. That means you have become a royal priest. You are serving the Lord now. You're giving back what he 
what already belongs to him. He has given us all of this stuff, and you're giving it back with joy. So that perspective, myself as a priest, is a totally different way than most Christians understand today. I am here to serve. I am here to sacrifice. I am here to let go. I am here for you. That concept is difficult. And often our attitude is one of, yeah, I'll have to give when I can. I'll give when I can. If I have the time, if it fits my schedule, oh, I'm willing to, well, really, I have already given my time. Let somebody else take it this time. That's typically our attitudes today, if we're going to be honest about it. But what Peter is describing here is totally the opposite. It's a daily sacrifice, a continual sacrifice for the Lord. And how long do we do that? As long as we breathe. As long as you're alive, you will continue to sacrifice. It doesn't matter if you're young. It doesn't matter if you're old. The Lord has called you to continually serve as his high priest. And then Peter also mentions holy nation. And again, he calls you. And when he calls you, he pulls you out from the rest of the world. And he says, now you're mine. Now you belong to me. And he has this holy people, this group. We have a spiritual connection. And it means lots of different ways people tend to separate again, like race, gender, male and female, languages, ethnic backgrounds, cultural, social class, oh, they have money, they don't have money, there's a separation. All of those different ways, all of those labels, but they mean nothing before the Lord. They mean nothing before the Lord. And once again, we have a new identity. Meaning all of us are the same, regardless of your language, regardless of where you live, regardless of your race, if you're deaf, if you're hearing, I belong to Jesus and you belong to Jesus, that means we have become one. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter about your background, how you grew up, my background, how I grew up. We, because of Jesus Christ, we have become one. You know that when you enter into heaven, God knows, oh, this person signs, this person speaks French. This person... Ooh, I don't even recognize their language. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. First of all, we won't have a problem understanding each other. Language will not be a barrier there. That's the heaven that we're looking forward to. But it makes me wonder, how are we living right now as brothers and sisters here? Do we tend to live like a holy nation, holy people? Or do we tend to socialize with people that we feel comfortable with? Oh, I like these kind of people. I don't really like that kind, so I'm not going to be with them. Do you realize what really hit me was, yeah, when we limit ourselves, meaning I refuse to recognize those people as my brothers and sisters, I refuse to recognize you as belonging to my nation. That means I'm rejecting the gospel. I am rejecting Jesus' work on the cross. Because when Jesus died and he rose again, all of those labels were gone. They were gone. And if I'm holding on to my label, Oh, my race is so important. My ethnic background is so important. My deafness, whether I'm hearing or deaf, whatever, that's important. I'm telling you, all of those labels can't save you. They cannot save you. The 
only label that matters is that I am his and you are his. That's it. My challenge when I'm teaching this, really there are two challenges. First of all, for me, it's really not just about teaching it, but really accepting it and believing in this. Yes, this does apply to me too. But also to help us understand how powerful verse 9 and 10 are right here. If we can fully understand Verses 9 and 10, wow, we have become an example for the world. God willingly pursues and captures and accepts you. His grace is poured out upon you. And he told you to show this over and over again. He says, you are mine, you are mine. You are mine. And from the human perspective, you might not succeed. You might be labeled a failure. It doesn't matter if he says you're still mine. You might struggle physically. You might struggle mentally. It doesn't matter. You are still mine, he says. Your body might be falling apart because of disease, age, whatever. He says, you are still mine. Whatever your problem is right now, whatever your struggles are, whether it's pain, whether it's a loss, you are still mine, he says, still mine. You might not have friends. Okay, you're still mine. I have accepted you, whatever you face, you just need to remember who you are, that you belong, you are a chosen, holy people. Live it, live it. In verse nine at the end. As a result, meaning because of who you are, you can show others the goodness of God. Because he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Your new identity means that you have a new mission. A new mission. And that mission is to show people his goodness. I want to tell you about my Savior. Hey, I want to tell you about my Savior. Jesus Christ changed my life forever. Are you curious how that happened? I want to show you how the Lord changed my life, my way of thinking, my perspective, my choices, my relationships. Everything changed. I have to tell you. I have to tell you how. I know that you need him too. Peter says that any opportunity you have, tell your story, share your story, explain how he called you from the darkness, how he pulled you out of the darkness and helped you to see and to recognize your sin and realize that's me and help me to understand that I need your forgiveness, Lord. And then he forgave me. Tell people. Explain how he leads your life now. Jesus Christ, he is my king. He is my Lord. And I submit everything to you. Tell your story. Tell your story. He is sovereign. He has wisdom. He has power and grace and love and he pours it down on me. He has changed me for eternity. Tell them. So 
when you leave here throughout the week you go back to your neighborhood go back to your jobs go back to your school wherever you go tell your story spread your story all over share the gospel all over tell people don't forget who you are in verse 10 You know that once I didn't belong. I didn't. I had no identity as his people. None. Now I belong to God. There was no mercy. Now he pours his mercy upon me. I have received his mercy. Don't forget. Because when you forget, what happens? Sin becomes easy. I forgot who I am. I got diverted. It's so easy. That self-centeredness becomes easy again. You take your focus away. I forgot who I was. Don't hide your faith. That becomes easy after a while. I don't want to disrupt things or cause problems. But you forgot who you are. You should don't allow the gospel, allow it to impact every area of your life so you don't forget. If you're not willing to let it hit everything, how you behave to your neighbor, how you make decisions. Remember, 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 long ago you were not his people, but now, now you are his. Long ago, you never received his mercy, but now you receive his mercy. Praise God for that. Don't forget, everything has changed. Everything has changed. Amen? Amen. Amen. Defender 